I can do on my side. It should be recording. Yeah, we can do this call. Um, so we will be, we are recording this and we will be posting the recording on the public lab website and the YouTube channel. So feel free to turn on or off your video depending on how you want to show the recording. Yeah, thank you for everyone for joining and listening in and for our presenters. So I'm really excited to have um, two really cool presenters today. You can just go around and do quick intros um, and share your name, where you're calling from, anything you're looking forward to hearing or sharing today. I am Vanya. I'm the Air Quality Research Creation Fellow calling from Los Angeles. So previously, um, Gabrielino Tongva land. And I am really looking forward to hearing about how community science can influence corporate and government actions and policy. I will popcorn it over to Jeanette. Thanks, Anya. Yeah, my name is Jeanette, and I am um, a research manager on the nonprofit team at Public Lab. I'm calling from Bellingham, Washington, um, pretty close to the Canadian border. And um, I'm really interested in hearing about active projects that are happening around air quality monitoring right now. So just really looking forward to hearing from, from the guest speakers about what they're, what they're working on. Um, and I will uh, pass it over to Christian. Hi, uh, Christian Torres with Comité Civico in Brawley, California. We're in Southern California near the border with Mexico. Uh, looking forward to hearing about other air quality projects and sharing our Ivan Air Community Air Monitoring Network and the outcomes we've had since the project launched uh, almost a decade ago now. And Mary Jo. Hi, I'm Mary Jo Burke. I live on the Lower East Side in Manhattan in New York City, and I'm part of a group called LES Breathe. And we started a community um, like citizen science project um, last about a year ago, um, but in the midst of COVID and also um, with the planned and now current destruction of East River Park. So that's what I will be presenting on. Um, and so our order today, Mary Jo will speak first and then um, we can kind of do any discussion questions at the end of the 20 minute session and then um, move on to Christian and then at the end we'll have kind of a little bit less than 10 minutes to um, have any follow up questions. So that's kind of the schedule for today and yeah, Mary Jo, take it away and feel free to share your screen. Okay. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Good to go. OK, great. Um, so I, first of all, I want to thank Public Lab for this, uh, especially Jeanette and Vanya, because you guys have been incredibly helpful throughout our project um, and connecting us with um, yourselves as well as other groups and other people who have been amazing in terms of sharing their knowledge. So I want to um, acknowledge you guys right off the bat. So. Um, my group is called LES Breathe, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a history and then talk about the organization itself. Let's see. So a brief history. Um, hold on, I need to get rid of the images of you guys uh, so I can actually see my screen. So a brief history of the project or what started um, all of this is in 2012, two days before Halloween, uh, Superstorm Sandy came up the East Coast and destroyed, you know, destroyed parts of, of New York, flooded us. And the, um, I th believe the final toll was 44 people were killed. And the, the, the map that's sort of right in the center there on the upper um, left in the center is, um, shows the city of New York and the, the flooding that happened throughout the city itself. The, this um, image right here below it shows the, the lower portion of Manhattan. And you can see how far the water came in in various sections. And so the East River, this is the East River Park that we're, we're talking about, but this is all the East River, um, east side of Manhattan that was flooded. Um, 
And this map right here shows uh, with different colors the, the amount of flooding that happened, the depth of the floodwaters. So that happened in 2012. Um, in 2013, President Obama launched a national design um, competition called Rebuild the Design to develop um, projects to prepare for future disasters. And architects, urban planners, and community groups came together to develop a project or the idea known as the Big U to work on ways to mitigate um, uh, flood risks in the city. 2014, um, United States Department of Housing and Urban Development selected the Big U as the project that the winner of the project. They committed between them and New York City $335 million to build the first section of the big. Um, project, the Big Ryu from Montgomery Street, which was right, approximately right here, all the way up to um, here. Um, and it's called the, it was called the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. 2014 to 2017, the, um, the city worked with um, neighborhood um, organizations, the, the city council groups, they developed task force um, community boards. They really worked with the, the neighborhood and engaged everyone, local stakeholders. And I think this um, says that there were uh, 12 meetings. It was a lot of meetings between the city and the organizations represented in this neighborhood. There's a lot of back and forth um, to develop the project. And so the proposed design was what you see here, this is the East River. And then this is the park. And then the, the FDR drive is this white line that runs along here. And so what they developed was a berm that would be on the east side of the FDR drive. And that would provide flood protection. The park itself would become sort of a, an area that would absorb water and the flooding could happen and then it would recede. Um, and so it would absorb the storm water, prevent the, the berm would prevent the water from getting into the neighborhood. And that was the approved plan. Um, March of 2018, Community Board 3, which represents most of the, the um, neighborhood along the East River, um, commits to the design and with a few uh, adjustments, including solar and wind lighting, uh, more education about resiliency and climate change um, for the neighborhood. Um, so that was March of 2018. After that, the city went quiet um, for about six months and they, they wouldn't communicate with the neighborhood, the groups and whatever. And at that point in October, the mayor's office came out and said, oh, by the way, we've scrapped that old plan and we're going to do this new plan. There was absolutely no input from the neighborhood. And um, they just said, this is, this is what's going to happen. And so what they decided to do is roughly from here all the way down to here, they were going to destroy the park, take out every living thing, all the buildings in the park, and then raise it up eight feet, eight to 10 feet. And that would become the, um, the flood protection for the neighborhood. And they said that they had to do it for two reasons. One of which was there's a con ed line that runs down here, which they should have known about before the first project even began. And second of all, they didn't know how to maintain a park that would flood. And um, the cost of this new project is about $1.45 billion. And that's even before um, there, are, there are sewer, combined sewer outflows through here. Those have to be done. So some people think that this project could very well be close to 2 billion when it's finished. In November of 2019, the city council approved um, this plan. And there are a number of us that um, in the neighborhood that didn't like the plan. We thought it was a terrible idea in terms of um, how to provide uh, flood protection for the neighborhood. So uh, a group called East River Park Action was formed. And it's basically don't kill a great park to, for a, a bad flood control plan. Um, another one was we need a green plan, not an environmental disaster. And bury the park or bury the plan, not the park. Um, and so these are a few pictures here by Pat Arnow that show the, the park being used and, and enjoyed. And then last year during COVID, when it was so clear that the park was so important to everyone to be able to get out into the, into the outdoors um, outside of their apartments, it became very clear that there was um, a health 
issue with all of this, um, having being able to have access to this park. And the park plan is supposed to be finished in five years. And the city of New York is notoriously bad about finishing projects on time. So we're very concerned about this. And so a group of us got together and we formed um, underneath the umbrella of East River Park Action, we formed LES Breathe. And so the, the goals of that are public health, transparency and awareness. And it's a citizen science group. Um, we're all volunteers and we want to provide um, real quality, or I'm sorry, real time air quality data for everyone. And so there's a group of us um, from that's Wendy, Veronica, Rebecca, Gigi, Giacomo, Brandon, um, Kate and Z from um, Beta NYC and Daniel from the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Those are sort of the, the core group that's worked at various times um, on this project. And the people donate money to East River Park Action as well as to LES Breathe and their monetary um, donations have been able to support our work. There's, um, we wanted to also do community outreach about indoor air quality. And that's our um, website there for us. Hold on, let me get the next one. And so more information about the neighborhood itself. The Lower East Side as shown on this map here uh, in the purple oval is an existing environmental justice area. Um, and this map over here is from the city and it shows this is the neighborhood right here in the orange circle. The, um, there are high impacts to air quality in the neighborhood from building emissions, building density and traffic density. And there's medium impact on the air quality from industrial um, sources. And the neighborhood again shown here in this purple and here, you can see how it stands out from the adjacent neighborhoods. We have higher than um, higher rates of asthma hospitalizations and emergency department um, uh, cases than our neighboring, um, the neighboring, the adjacent neighborhoods. So in the, the city itself has um, some, sm a small amount of permanent air, qual air, air quality monitors throughout the city. And they also do four times a year, they, um, they look at air quality in different parts of the city and the monitors are up for seven days, I think. And there are no permanent monitors. I'm gonna change my, I'm gonna annotate that at the end of this. I, there, at the, I don't think there are any permanent monitors um, in the neighborhood, but I'm gonna update that at the end, I think. Um, so we have one here that's a temporary um, or one seasonal monitor here. And there was a report put out by the environmental justice, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance um, in the beginning of this year. And they did a community air mapping project. They looked at um, air quality in the South Bronx and also in Williamsburg, which is right here. And this is the Williamsburg Bridge um, right here, which comes across right there and into the, our neighborhood. So it's just across the river from us. And what they did is they wanted to compare the readings of hyperlocal um, readings monitoring compared with the permanent stationary ones. And they use what's this here, which is an air beam handheld device. And they um, did walkabouts in their neighborhood. And in this map right here, the darker color is the worst air, um, the worst the air color, the worst the air quality. And the hotspots are shown. Um, in orange. So you can see this is near the, the roadways, the major roadways. So what they discovered is that there's some locations where there were up to, um, the readings with the handheld were up to 20 times higher than the ones, the permanent or the more the stationary units. So they talked about the need for hyper-local um, uh, air monitoring. And so what we did is we reached out to a man who I believe is one of the founders of the company for Airbeam. Uh, somebody in our group knew him. And so we borrowed a uh, Airbeam and we tested it out and we, we liked it, but it was, it, it was connected to an app and the app was only an Android. And it was a little bit complicated in terms of how you use the interface and how you get it to give you um, readings and information in the data. We also um, talked to this organization called Tembo and they were very helpful and very um, eager to work with us. 
And what they would do is they um, work with us to figure out the monitor types that we would need, where to put them, help us get them installed and then do support afterwards. But it was way more much money than we could afford. Um, so we had to say no, but they also produce what this is showing right here. It's called the daily breather that sends you an email every day uh, and tells you the um, the air quality in your area. The one issue with this is um, the monitor that's hooked up to the, so, you know, the, that provides the data for this may not be close. This one, last I checked, their monitor was five, um, five miles away. So that's not really in New York City. It doesn't really actually in anywhere. It's not local air, air monitoring. So we did research on our own um, and we ended up with um, purchasing uh, purple air monitors, which is a photograph here of this one and also um, AtmoTube. These are handheld and uh, you can do walkabouts with them. And you can, I have one in my apartment. Um, you can go on a bike ride. You can walk to the grocery store. You can give it to a friend and just test it out. And so the thing that the purple air monitors are stationary and they, um, they don't have an app but you can go online either on your phone or on your computer and they produce um, readings um, here. They produce readings like this one here. And this unit is actually now online. It's another one of ours. So this is our LES breathe one, two, three, and now four. And um, so it's, you're able to get uh, PM 2.5 readings. You're able to get temperature humidity uh, readings. And they also produce, if you click on the button, you, you can see a graph of what's happening, how the air has, um, the air quality has, like this is a spike here. And so you can see a reading over time, which is great. And then for the um, Atmo tube, which is small and you can, you know, I, I've attached it to my bike, I've attached it to my backpack and it gives you readings like this. And so 100 is the best, 78 is reasonable. My apartment the other day was um, 44. So indoor air quality was really bad. Um, and you can, it, you can produce a map like this and show you pinpoint it. And then also you can look at the, um, the readings. They'll give you a graph of how your air quality is doing. You, you can do that for the temperature for the VOCs, they also check VOCs, which is here. And that's the issue for me mostly in my apartment is the VOCs. So even with my windows open, it's not the greatest air quality, which makes me um, worried. Uh, we've done community outreach. Uh, we have um, Instagram and Twitter, though we're not uh, as good as we should be about posting frequently, but we're, we're working on that. We did a, um, a handout about air quality indoors here. And one thing about our neighborhood is we have um, English, Spanish, and Chinese speakers. So we produced these, I didn't show you the Chinese, but we produced these um, handouts about, you know, cleaning your apartment, opening your windows, um, minimizing indoor air pollutant, pollutants um, in English, Spanish, and Chinese. And we also had a way to share your story about, um, uh, the, the park, um, see the park map, and also more about LES Breathe here. Um, we also did a survey of the neighborhood about um, how you feel about the park. And we pr produced that again in Chinese, English, and Spanish. And you can see in English, it was 97 respondents, Chinese one and Spanish one. So one of the issues, oops, sorry, one of the issues we're coming up, up against is, is um, translation and outreach into neighborhoods that aren't um, English speakers first, because that's our, most of us are English speakers first. Um, and then we did a walkabout, sorry about the noise. We did a walkabout um, where we partnered with a, a woman was doing, um, she was doing, she's an artist and she was doing data research on the neighborhood and then she was producing a, a performance piece. And so this um, is a part of us. This is Wendy from our group and this is Wendy again. Um, with the rat that was discussed um, during her performance in the park. And then after that, we did a walkabout with our Atmo tubes. And we, um, this was the map we started here. We wandered around the neighborhood, wandered up and then along the East River. And we um, sampled the air, but we also had people write down their impressions of what was going on as they walked. 
so we could um, see how the air quality was affected um, by certain things that were happening as we walked. Wendy also did a brief demonstration about how you can um, take a box fan and add a, um, uh, a furnace filter to it to clean the air and another um, like an adjustable um, window screen that you can put in the window that has a filter in it um, to, uh, to um, filter the air coming in. Visualization, we haven't done a great deal yet. Um, we're working on that. And so Public Lab, you guys were great, did this. This is um, on the 4th of July, I was here in New York City and I was watching the fireworks um, on television because I wasn't in my apartment close to the, um, to the river. And so the, this is the East River and this is where the fireworks were happening. But I was, when I was watching it, I noticed that there was so much smoke in the air. So I started checking the readings from Purple Air and you can see this, this was, so the fireworks I believe for roughly 9.40 to about 10 o'clock. So this is a screenshot at 10.17 and you can see this is the area directly around where the fireworks were happening. And these readings are really bad, but even worse were the readings in Midtown on the West side. And I don't know, I don't think there were fireworks on the West side, but I think this may be because um, there were fireworks smoke coming from New Jersey. So it was getting hit from two places. And then this is a screenshot of the, um, the purple air map about 12, 12 32 AM my time. So that was on the East Coast. And so most of the fireworks had been um, set off in this in this um, in continental US by then. And you could see how bad the air quality was. And this was, I don't think the fires were really that bad at this point, but this was, um, the air quality was terrible in the United States. And then on the left here, this is AtmoTube. So Brandon um, visualized the data from our AtmoTube um, um, devices and he was able to, we were able to get the, the color program or whatever it's called from, um, from AtmoTube. So he was able to visualize it in the colors that the app uses itself. So the brighter blue, the greener is better. And the, um, the hotspots, the VOC hotspots, you can see as the circles and they get bigger as the, the VOCs get, up, get higher and higher. And some of this is like this, I know some people have been in a car, I was in a car. So the, the larger map of this shows the, the, um, the dots traveling farther north and away from the city. But this is a highlight of what's um, a first go round of the highlight of, this, of what's happening in the city with our monitors. And so this, in the beginning, I said that there are no permanent air, um, air quality monitors in the city, but I've, we've just discovered that there are actually some that are, we don't know if they're going to be permanent or if, um, I'm sorry about the construction noise, if you guys can hear that. So the, um, there are, on the website, there are 10 locations listed and currently there are only five um, monitors shown. One up here in the Cross, Cross Bronx, Queens College, Queensboro Bridge, this one's not active. The Williamsburg Bridge is the closest to the park along here. And then the Manhattan Bridge here is relatively close as well. And so it says that at, some, at any given point, the monitors may not be producing data. So I don't know yet what that means and I need to do some investigating. But this shows, um, these graphs show various readings. Um, this was a reading I took yesterday afternoon a screenshot and you can see um, this is the Manhattan Bridge, which is this one right here. And the, um, the spikes and um, variations in the air quality. This shows all of the um, devices reporting at the same time. And the blue, the blue here and the green here are, this is the blue is the closest to the park and this is a, the next closest. And you can see that unfortunately, we tend to be the highest, um, have the highest readings, which is the worst um, air quality. And this one was, I think this was five days back. This showed a huge spike on the Williamsburg Bridge. And there's a tremendous amount. I actually went to this location because on the website, it gives you the, um, the geolocators. And so I was able to go to this. And so this is right, um, there's a, he it's heavy trafficked and this may very well have been either, um, 
traffic was really bad or maybe even a car was uh, or truck was idling near it. Um, so this is, we're going to get, we need to get more information on this because if this is um, going to be permanent or relatively permanent, it will be a great way to compare our readings with this unit um, as a, as a you know, comparison going forward. And then these are pictures I took, <laughs> it's just heartbreaking, this fall. Um, and, th so, and then Time Out New York, December 7th, so it's the 16th. So this was, um, what was it, 11, uh, nine days ago, um, Time Out New York declared the East River Park the best park in the city. And you know these are lovely images of our park. And then this is currently what's happening. They, are, they have started destroying the park. It's been a week and a half. They've been working even with a temporary restraining order um, against them. And um, today there's, there's supposed to be a judge reviewing the case and I don't know if they're going to stop, but they've already destroyed the trees in half of the park and, they're, and it's, they, they worked over the weekend, they worked 24 hours a day and they've just been going at, a, you know, at an amazing clip to destroy as much as they can um, in the park. And that's my presentation. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mary Jo. Um, yeah, I've heard bits and pieces of it, but it's really nice to be able to hear the whole thing from top to bottom. Um, definitely unfortunate that you know, this destruction is still going on. We, if anyone has questions, we can take one question now, and then we'll have a little more time for questions at the end of both presentations. Should I stop sharing my screen? um you have not started you have not stopped sharing yeah okay let me stop there now i can see you guys again anyone have hey i have a question can you sure. hear me yeah hey mary joe i was wondering last we spoke you said that there was some event going on by the at the park by your apartment with like clowns gathering at the park gates or something like that i believe am i clowns. mistaken yeah, it was something that they were like trying to basically goof on the fact that they were going to destroy the park. So they were going to like bar entry for people who were trying to get into the park. Well, they tried. Um, there were protesters. A number of people have been arrested. Um, I don't remember the clowns. If I said that, I, I, I can't remember. So my apologies <laughs> to that. Um, there have been prote numerous protests, some of which I've been a party to. Um, a number of people have volunteered to be arrested and they have been arrested. Um, and it, it's, it doesn't matter. The police are arresting people. They're letting the construction happen. And so, I mean, it's even if the judge stops it again right now, it doesn't really matter because they've destroyed, I bet you, you know, if it's half the park, there are 991 trees in the park. So let's just say they've taken down 400 trees. It's just, it's just hor horrific to see. Yeah, that's so much. And, I'm so sorry about that. Thank you. And the other thing too, is the city has now said, you know, this project is supposed to protect us to 2050. And they said, and we know the sea level rise data is getting worse and worse. And so they said, well, you know, if this doesn't provide protection in 2050, we'll just do it all over again, which means they'll just take those trees that have been growing for, let's say maybe 25 years, they'll just rip those out again, as opposed to coming up with a plan. You know, why didn't they do, I think, it, I think you know, why didn't they provide the protection right at the edge of the, the river and raise it up high there? Why didn't they cover the FDR drive? There are many other ideas that were proposed, but it's at this point, I think it's too late. It's, it's incredibly sad and it's just, it's heartbreaking actually. But yeah. yeah. I'm sorry so to hear you. that. Thank of you. Of course. If anyone has any other questions, we can cover those at the end. But thank you again, Mary Jo. Super, very insightful and very. Interesting. My pleasure. Thank you for Thanks. that. Next up, um, we have Christian. Um, looking at the butcher pronunciation, so I will let you do your introduction. Sure. Um, so thank you for that, Mary Jo. It was a very interesting presentation. And I do want to talk to you more about this uh, situation there. Uh, so my name is Christian. Uh, 
Torres with from the Pacific Valley Valle and Southern California, like I said before. Uh, I'll be presenting on the Ivan Air Network, which is our community air monitoring uh, with low cost sensors. Um, so some background, the project started as a collaboration between uh, ourselves as a community-based organization, um, partners at the state. Uh, at the time, it was called the California Environmental Health Tracking Program. Uh, now it, it goes under Tracking California, so it's a little easier to pronounce. And um, Dr. Edmund Cedas Lab uh, at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, and the, the group aimed uh, as a project team to provide local level air quality monitoring data and in real time. Um, and the reason for that is because we live in Imperial County on the southern end of, of California, bordering to Mexico. And this is just a, an overview of what typically our, our geography is. Uh, you know, we're just uh, it's classified by California legislature. We're a disadvantaged community. Uh, we rent very low in access to healthcare, uh, socioeconomic status, education, um, and live next to, next to a lot of areas with, that provide emissions or that emit a lot of pollutants. Um, as you can see, this is a typical kind of uh, geography for our area. Uh, unless you live in a city, you're uh, living out in the uh, rural areas, and you can see some homes here in, this, in, the, in the picture next to the, the parcels of, of farmers and agriculture. And we have a big uh, farm worker population, a uh, big Hispanic population. As again, we're in Southern California, next to the border. So over 85% now identify as Hispanic, uh, with 90% of, of the population here in Imperial County as of the last census identifying as people of color. Uh, we, almost a quarter of our county lives in, uh, under the uh, under uh, the level of, federal level of poverty. And that's, you know, that's based on all of our data. We haven't even seen the impact of COVID fully yet here, but this is just sort of, sort of the situation that was there um, almost a, dec uh, a decade ago, carrying on till now. Um, and we also suffer disproportionate effects for asthma rates. Uh, so in California, we suffer 15% more asthma in our population than, than the state of California does. Um, and that's because of all these pollutants that are coming. Uh, Imperial County is also, sandwiched in between two different uh, areas of concern, which is the Salton Sea to the north, which is uh, uh, this man-made uh, lake, which is now drying out because water isn't imported into it. And what that contains is a lot of the runoff from our agriculture and canals that go from Mexico into the US. That is where the water ends up. So now that it's drying out, all the pollutants that have been deposited there are being emitted into the local communities. And as I mentioned before, we're on the border with Mexico. Uh, Mexico doesn't have the strongest enforcement and regulations for pollutants, and there is a big manufacturing there, uh, manufacturing there because we are living next to the capital of Baja California, with over one million people there. So we do see a lot of manufacturing that isn't well enforced uh, practices there. So the project aimed to provide this local air quality monitoring network using low cost sensor technology, which um, in 2013 to through, through 2016 was still in development. And, in implement, and community implementation. And the aim was to bring community into the project and have them help decide where monitors would go, what areas of concern we have to find, and what the lived, their lived experience showcased were areas that, that were real problem areas. This is a picture of the original uh, community steering committee. Uh, and I know it's a 15 member group, but sometimes, you know, uh, community, steering committee members would bring their family, friends that were also interested in, in the public health effects of pollution in, in their area. And what they would do is provide a lot of the decision-making um, input so that they would vote on areas where monitors would go. They would recruit people to help with activities, such as this next one, which is our hazard mapping activity. So this is one of the key activities for the development of the project, which was mapping of key hazards uh, using community members uh, and other advocates, other local advocates, they were also wanted to be part of this. So what they were done is, is they were given a smartphone, uh, which in 2013 was still relatively new to some folks here, um, or paper forms. They would go out, take pictures, write down the information for where they were at, and find what, what was what, and write down why it was an area of concern. So that could have been um, a business that was doing chrome plating. It could have been a, a, a 
a processing plant, or it could have been transportation. We have a big industrial sector in one of our cities, which is next to, to the disadvantaged community of that, of that specific city. We come up a situation where uh, across the tracks, it's not so pretty. Um, so folks were able to go out and do these ha this hazard mapping activity. And they did this, and what that helped inform was their monitor deployment. So here I'm showcasing what the monitors look like. This is uh, what the stationary monitors uh, look like. They were, they were deployed for PM10 and PM2.5. And part of the, the, the hazard mapping activity and the steering committee decision-making was to provide um, input into where we could deploy monitors. So on the, on the right side of the screen, I'm showcasing um, where the monitors are all at. Um, based on scientific criteria, red markers do that. The purple markers are actually where the steering committee pick where monitors should be first be deployed. So it was uh, the original project deployed 40 monitors and half of them were deployed through community concerns and the other 20 were deployed by scientific criteria uh, based on our partners from the University of Washington and the Jack in California program. And this really helped create a lot of coverage um, because we only had uh, three stationary government sites throughout the whole county, which were in the cities. Nothing was nothing was really being gathered about the rural areas. And we do have a lot of the population that works and lives in the rural areas of our county. And as you can see on, on the satellite image to the right, all those green parcels, that means there's there's farms there, which means that there's workers and people there throughout the day. And sometimes even from early morning, so we're talking from 2 a.m. to about 8, 9 p.m. working out there. And they're being affected by all of these things. So that, this is why we wanted the greatest coverage uh, possible in the county. Uh, this is just an, uh, an overview of what the monitoring system looks like. So our monitors have the sensor and actually a, a control board and a, and a, a small computer, which I'll, I'll show on camera here. And this is actually the brain for the monitor. And what the monitor does is the sensor collects the data our, our controller has a humidity and temperature sensor. And every five minutes, a data point is uploaded uh, to our server. The data point is, is then, then goes through a al uh, calibration algorithm, which was done by co-locating our monitors with government monitors in our area. And then that calculates a community air quality level, as you can see here, where it says um, from, da from data to monitor to network, to database. From that database, one of the outputs is this uh, Ivan logo that's at the bottom, and that's our, our public facing website, which showcases the, the monitor data. And we showcase it not as a level of PM 2.5 or PM 10. We do showcase those numbers, but we also show this calculation that is uh, similar to the air quality index, but we called it the community air quality level because we were, we were using low cost sensor technology. We didn't want to say this is the AQI. No, this is a community air quality level based on the calculations and the scientific work that was put into the project. And we have other tools that come out of this database, which is uh, we get a um, the project team here at, at our, my organization gets a daily email that says which monitors are uploading data and which aren't because we provide maintenance to these monitors um, on a daily basis, uh, depending on which areas are, are down. We have a download script so we can download the raw data from the monitors to be able to help ac academics or, or government agencies who, who have an interest in looking at the data specific for, for areas where they don't have their own monitors. We have this other tool called a data graph, which we use when we're doing maintenance on monitors to see that the monitor is uploading data. So we see an outlier in this data graph, we can say, okay, what, did something happen here or is the monitor or sensor itself having some sort of uh, issue and we can tr try to try to track it that way. And this is what the monitor looks like um, when you open it up. So like I mentioned, we have with this enclosure, which is the gray and, and the gold piece. This enclosure was selected because it's weatherproof. Uh, we live in an area where for about nine and a half to 10 months of the year, we have weather that's over hundred degrees. So it has a cooling fan already installed. So this fan turns on after 85 degrees and, keep, and keeps the the components cool enough so they can operate and don't turn off because of the heat or get damaged because of the heat. Um, we have, uh, we use the, sen the sensor we use in these monitors is the Daedalus DC 1700. What we did is we worked with the manufacturer, so the Daedalus Corporation, to install custom software so that the monitors actually read at four different size 
particulate matter bins. Uh, these range from PM uh, 0.5 uh, to PM 10. So using those four different bins, the team at the University of Washington was actually able to do the co-location and develop this calibration algorithm that was able to take these four different sizes of particulate matter into this community air quality level that I mentioned before, and that'll showcase when we look at the ISM websites. Um, we use the Arduino, which is the microcomputer that I showed, showed a little bit ago, and that's what controls the monitor. That's what tells it to upload the data. It collects the data, uh, and it also saves the data to an onboard SD card. So if we ever do have a monitor that loses internet connectivity, we can go pick up the SD card and fill in that data gap in our server by just pulling the data straight from the SD card and then putting it back into the, to the Arduino. Um, the Arduino also has network access, so it has a Wi-Fi antenna, but it also has an Ethernet port where you can actually plug it in. And at one of our sites, we're, or several of our sites where we're at on schools, they've actually given us wired internet access so that our monitors uh, really rarely go offline unless there's a power search because it's the only time. Uh, to maintain the monitor data, we have a cloud database. So we've actually uh, took over the project from the University of Washington after the initial grant ended. And now we have a, a non an unstaffed programmer that actually maintains the, the monitoring data on a cloud database through uh, Amazon. And like I mentioned before, we have a public web portal which we showcase that data as community air quality levels. And I'll show that a little bit later on. But what, the, what we do is we have both a list. So as it can be seen through purple air or air being where they showcase a, a graph or just numbers. But we also have a map that showcases the, the general area where the monitors are placed. And we have the cow showcasing as it's a color index as well, as, uh, similar to the EQI mentioned before. Um, so the, the process to make sure that the data was good and, and uh, we were providing a, a, a good service to the community because it wasn't just about collecting data, it was about making sure the community could use the service of air notifications, air quality data, uh, was sensor calibration. So what I'm showing here is a picture of the actual uh, state um, the Air Resources Board for California has a station in, in Calexico, which is the city near the border, uh, where they monitor ambient air quality data. And here is where we were able to actually co-locate three of our monitors. So you, there's two in the picture here, uh, but we actually had a third one that was on, a, on the tripod on the other side uh, near their, their federal standard monitors. And we were able to do this so that the team at the University of Washington could develop this calibration algorithm where we could try to closely match the readings that the federal monitors are doing with our low air quality, uh, low cost air quality sensors. Um, and we're actually doing this not just with our monitors, but we also provide technical assistance services to other organizations in California that are doing this. And the first step that we tell them once they build their initial monitors is that we have to do a sensor calibration to their area because we are not affected by the sim they're not affected by the simple rules that we are here in Southern California. They might be in the, in the center part of California where they do have agriculture, but they also have oil and gas industry, which we don't have here. So we have to calibrate it to their area. And this is one of the first things that we, that we try to walk, uh, to help them through and walk them through how to uh, access. Uh, so part of the sensor validation process that we also did was a collocation with events. And this is where we actually took uh, state monitors into the schools. We actually did our, our co-locations at five different uh, school sites through our county. And I list the cities here. And the bottom one, which is at, which has Colexico, um, I showed that earlier before in another picture, but that's actually where the old port of entry used to be. So one of our, our problem areas here is because uh, we are a border community. There are thousands of thousands of vehicles idling at the border, uh, which are just committing a lot. And the border front of entry used to be connected, both the pedestrian and the passenger. So folks would be walking really neck, uh, so just separated by a brick wall with, from vehicles that were idling there, sometimes up to three, four hours. Uh, and when I say thousands, I really do mean thousands. Uh, Imperial County's population is about 185,000 people uh, with Mexicali, the, our, our uh, border city, being over 1.3 million. So you can just imagine the discrepancy when traffic comes from Mexico into the U.S. And we have we have a very binational population as well. So there's a lot of crossing in between uh, the U.S. to Mexico and back and forth. Um, these are some of the quality control measures that we take for our monitors. So as I mentioned before, we have a data graph. Uh, this is what the data graph looks like in the center of the, of the slide. Um, and the data graph helps us do quality control checks for monitors. 
we're actually in the process of automating this process. Uh, we're working with our uh, with the the developer of the monitor who used to be at the University of Washington. He got his PhD and and that is now actually working in in Seattle as you know at the Puget Sound Air Quality Agency. So we're still working with them to kind of implement new quality control measures and improve on on what we have. The bottom is a screenshot of what our daily emailer looks like. So it shows you the data completeness coming in for monitors. So as you can see, so most of these are at 99% or over. And the two that are, well, ID number one is really blank because that's for testing purposes, but four was offline, but we had a designated site, so it already had a name that was attached. And on the right, you'll see one of our technicians actually out there doing maintenance. So we can try to do maintenance to the monitors uh, once every 30 days. And if there is a monitor that goes offline from one day to the next, we also go out there and do troubleshooting as needed. Usually the troubleshooting requires us to take out the dialogs, check it for any quality control issues. So it could be that something got into the dialogs. It could be that the dialogs uh, just isn't retaining power anymore, even if it's when it's plugged in. Uh, but a lot of the time, one of our main issues is that uh, the Arduino just disconnects from a mobile hotspot or the internet connection. So we just have to do a power reset and it's pretty, and it pretty much goes back online and the team is working. Um, and this is just a screen grab of our website. So when you go to the Ivan Air website, um, you do get three options. You can get the list of the monitors, so which this will just showcase the monitor um, name, the location, and the community air quality level at that time. You can go to the map of the monitor, so that'll show you a map where every monitor is at, and, and it's color coded to the community air quality level. Or you can sign up for air quality alerts, which is one of the main services we provide to our, our, our Ivan project, where you can sign up for an alert for the school you're, you're attending, uh, school you're taking your child to. If you go near the border a lot, you can sign up for the monitors near the border. Uh, and you sign up to know whether when the air quality is bad and you get a notification on, um, through your email. Uh, we also, in the process of developing a, a natural mobile app that'll go on the Google Play Store and, and the iOS Store. So you can just get those notific like instant notifications on your phone. We have we've had a beta app that worked really well. It's just about tying in our live data to the the data we tried on on that app. But that's also in the, in the process. Um, and when I talk about community air quality levels, this is what I mean. Uh, so it's it's very similar to the AQI except we we stopped at the at the unhealthy level. We didn't want to go into the purple and the the rest of the colors because at that point it is already unhealthy. And that was um, also to keep it simple, as our steering committee members also gave us public input into the development of this table. Uh, but like similar, so if you're if the cal is between zero and fifty, it's low risk. Uh, fifty one to one hundred, it's moderate. So if you're a sensitive receptor, if you have any conditions that might be affected by particulate matter, maybe you should watch out. Uh, one hundred and one to one hundred and fifty, that's where it's un un unhealthy for sensitive groups. Again, uh, you have to watch out for symptoms. Watch out for for your exposure to these to these air quality episodes and anything above 150 is unhealthy and that's where we tell people to avoid uh, physical activity outdoors and avoid ex exposure to those areas um and this is just to showcase the difference of uh, what the list looks like versus the map uh this is the beta uh, version of the map that we were working on previously uh and we're we're in the process of updating it again but this is what the list looks like and as you can see, as I mentioned, which is the city, the location of the monitor. We usually use a, a landmark or cross streets to provide people, the private residences, their privacy. So we don't list any actual addresses for those. Um, and this is just to showcase some of our partners. So we work well with schools. We actually, our, our launch for this project was at the Brawley Union High School here for, uh, in the city of Brawley, where our office are at. We actually saw a banner next to the monitor, and they're actually part of another research project that is looking at the air quality data there. Uh, high school in Calipatria, which is a community partner location. They also help with other community research projects and they, they're always proud to showcase the monitor at their site. And the California Air Resource Support Station in Calexico, where we're still co-located uh, with the regular train monitors, which we're looking to use the data from this co-location to improve our calibrations, uh, which we're trying to do uh, at least once a year now. And this is what it looks like if you go to the website to sign up for air quality alerts. So you can, like I mentioned before, you can sign up for monitors, tell um, any information that you'd like to know uh, when the map uh, is displaying or, or the monitors are collecting the data. The data. 
you can sign up and then you'll get this notification. And the whole, one of the overarching goals of this project was to democratize data. We, uh, we were living in an area where the data was hit, semi-hidden on these government websites. It wasn't easy to find. It wasn't easy for people to get notifications or to know when they, they shouldn't be out, out and outside being exposed. Um, and that is that is one of the main outputs of having this project. We democratize the data. This, this data is public. We provide data to academics, to government agencies, and actually discovered flaws in, in the way the government was uh, collecting data here. Uh, they actually had monitors that were calibrated to other regions, which put a cap on the data they were collecting. And we showcased that there were there were hundreds of episodes that they were not collecting the right data. Their PM levels were exceeding natural standards too many times, and they were only getting half of that or a fraction of that in some years. And that is my slide there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christian. That was a lot of information, great information. And I'm surprised we got through all of that in 20 minutes, <laughs> but that was awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a couple minutes at the end. I know we're running close to the top of the hour, um, but any, any questions from folks? Um, I actually do have a quick question for Christian. So how does your funding work? Uh, so the initial NIH grant was a five-year project. Um, when that initial era grant ended, we were actually funded by the state um, California Regional Support to do maintenance and operations for about 18 months. Um, but we also have had funding from philanthropy. So we do apply to these grants about environmental education and environmental awareness that we've been able to use. Um, we've also had another grant come through the state of California and their community air protection program, which is basically our Ivan project, but put into the government structure. So they took what we did and, and, and created this grants program and we applied and we were able to get that support for three years. Uh, but it has been through philanthropy, through state grants, um, and also support from community members. Uh, some private residents have let us host monitors at their location. So we, we, uh, we don't pay for power, we don't pay for internet. Once the monitor is there, we just have to have access for maintenance to make sure the monitor is performing well. Awesome, thank you. I know that's always a challenge for communities to find. Anyone else have questions? I have so I'm many speaker. questions. <laughs> So I, first of all, I want to know, Christian, this is great. It's, it, uh, the project is incredible. So I'd like to be able to contact you to talk more about it in depth because it's, it's three minutes to the hour. So, um, but yes, I wanted to find out about funding. I wanted to find out connections because you said they have SD cards, but it sounds like they're actually sending data every five minutes. Um, I want to know more about funding. I, I want to look at your website. It's, it, the project looks amazing. So. I want to look into it and then would love to talk to you, um, you know, after that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, and sorry if I couldn't go through everything, but uh, yeah, we actually developed this community care monitoring guidebook out of the project, which was written by um, the project team, you know, uh, Comité Cívico, uh, Track in California, and the University of Washington. So I'd be happy to share those resources, share our website, share everything really that we do. Uh, like I said, we also are a technical assistance provider. So we have been uh, subcontracted by a lot of different organizations where our local air district even subcontracted us to do community monitoring as part of their designation as, a, as an AB 617 community, which is what the air protection program is in California. So we're actually doing that the same type of work that we did for this project, but for our local air district, because they know they don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to do it. And we have the, the local expertise to actually create that work out. So I'll be happy to share those resources as well. How long has your organization been doing this? Because you guys, it, you've achieved incredible amounts of um, of work data and the whole thing. How long have you guys been? So the network launched in 2016 with the first monitor. Uh, the organization has a history that goes back to 1987 when it became incorporated. Uh, but it really was started by farm workers, for farm workers, and it started working on, on those issues first. Yeah. Uh, and we still do, we, we provide a lot of support for farm workers uh, because that is our culture here, uh, that we know that a, a lot of the, the population works there. Um, but it transitioned slowly into environmental justice in the mid 2000s. And that is where we started doing monitoring. We actually have a handheld monitor uh, behind my computer, um, which was used before 
we've collaborated with our local university and even the Department of Pesticides to do local types of monitoring projects. And that carried over into this Ivan project. And you called these low cost monitors, but they don't look low cost. How much does the monitor cost typically? Uh, once it's fully built out, and it does depend on where we're going to uh, we're going to locate it because it's a stationary monitor, it can range between twelve to twelve hundred dollars to two thousand dollars because of the the measures that we take when it's um, the microcomputer and, and, and the control shield that we attach to it, internet access, um, and really uh, a lot of the cost goes to the weatherproof enclosure uh, because that's what's going to maintain it. Like I said, like we live in an area where the, the weather gets very hot. I yeah. want to make sure that these monitors are working because um, actually, and I'll say this because I know you said you, you've, uh, you've seen or you've worked with Purple Air. The Purple Air uh, here where we did a project with uh, another air district actually had a lot of failures because of the weather because they don't have a system to make to make sure it keeps cool. And it is really a PVC pipe around the two plant tower centers. And we saw that that happen and, and we didn't want that to happen to our monitors. Yeah, and so do you have issues with dust and sand? And and it looks like the, um, I, I've been learning about regenerative agriculture and it looks like a lot of your fields are, are bare. So I imagine there's a lot of dust and dirt in the air. So I would think that your enclosures, um, that's important for that too. Cause the purple air you could, you know cause it doesn't have, as you say, a protection stuff can get up in there. Um. Yeah, so we do have that. Uh, we actually started using a bit of a mesh screen so that it's not too constrictive to just keep really critters out. We used to have wasps, right. bees, uh, those, <laughs> kind of lizards. You'd open it up and. <laughs> yeah, we actually had a wasp nest to kind of grow in one of our monitors because of that. But um, yeah, we used a mesh screen and we actually have this um, plug in um, uh, like handheld air compressor uh, because we were recommended by the manufacturer to clean out the dialogues with hand uh, air compressor. But that it's not environmentally friendly, it's not cost effective. So, right. And we found this compressor that for $35, we could just plug into the monitor because it has four outlets to clean yep. it out. And that's how we maintain it clean. That's why we do side visits every 30 days because there can be an accumulation of dust and other uh, materials in there. It's a great project. I, I can't wait to learn more. I can't wait to dig into your website. It's terrific. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, thank you both so much. I know we are over time and I definitely, I. I think this is going to warrant so much more discussion. And we do have weekly open calls. I believe there should be one next week. Is, is that still on? There is one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, they, those are at um, 12 Pacific on Tuesdays. So I can resend information to anyone who needs it. Up to continue discussion. And, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone and I'm going to post this link and this is a link just to like stay, stay connected after the research area review and also provide any feedback you have and speakers and attendees are both all welcome for feedback so again thank you so much for being on here we will um, be writing out some notes after the event and also posting this so you'll get the notes in the recording so feel free to share that afterwards. Again, thank you so much for, for your time and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, Manya. Thanks, Thanks Christian. Thanks, Alana. Thanks, Christian.